Shabbat Shalom. In every service, the, uh, the highlight is the Amidah. And Shabbat, we also have the, the dual highlight of the Torah service, but the Amidah is the one that we find in all of our services at any given time, whether it be weekday, Shabbat, or holiday. And in the Amidah, we always conclude with the same theme for the final blessing, the theme of peace, Shalom. Excellent. Whether it's Osei Shalom, whether it's Sim Shalom, the two main variants of that prayer, we finish with the theme of Shalom, of peace. It is uh, very symbolic of Judaism's desire that peace be the crowning achievement of life, that peace be the ultimate measure of whether we have attained the fulfillment in life. Good. So let's talk about what peace actually might look like under the current circumstances. I mean, I know that most of us are focused in uh, the day-to-day -day minutia. We, we get our news reports, or God forbid, your social media reports, because that hardly counts as information, about the various activities, uh, the number of people who have uh, fallen, the number of uh, people who have been uh, rescued or who have been released, the uh, minutia of the claims of this side versus that side, the, the outlandish things that we talked about last week. Um, but that's losing sight of the ultimate goal. The ultimate goal is peace. peace. Very good. You've got it in one. So what actually might be done to achieve shalom, to achieve peace? Well, there's a plan right now that's out that I think we can talk about that might give us a little bit of a framework to see exactly what it might look like and what it might not look like and what some of the obstacles are. Uh, hopefully, in all of the flood of information that you've been receiving about the, uh, the war, you saw that there was a proposal from Egypt uh, regarding a, uh, a staged ceasefire that could translate into eventually a, a peaceful resolution. People are vaguely familiar hearing a little bit about this. So you're forgiven if you're not, because Hamas has been very antithetical to it. I, I believe they just yesterday began to say, well, we can talk. Um, but they have been very much opposed. But let's talk about what Egypt is proposing, see why Hamas might be uh, unwilling to go along with this, see what Israel's stakes are, and we'll work on it from there. So the Egyptian proposal is pretty straightforward. Um, and in many ways, it is kind of like, well, duh, from an outside point of view. It is the idea that there would be a ceasefire that would include the release of the remaining hostages. Um, no surprises there. Obviously, Israel is interested in getting the hostages back. Obviously, the Gazans are interested in the war no longer blowing things up. Seems like a pretty straightforward idea. But as you know from our previous conversations, <clears throat> I pardon my fuzzy vocal cords, Israel is not interested, at least as far as we can tell, in allowing Gaza to return to situation normal with Hamas in power. As such, Egypt has also put forward that part of this ceasefire would eventually involve a phased removal of Hamas from the Gaza, uh, the Gaza Strip and a substitution of a the technical term they're using is technocratic government, meaning a non-militant, non-terrorist government, most likely guided or indeed run by the Palestinian Authority, which is currently in control of the West Bank, and who used to be in charge of Gaza before the civil war between them and Hamas uh, back in 2007. And that would then ensure that there would be no military terrorist organization in charge of Gaza, and then Israel could withdraw all of its forces from Gaza, uh, no longer needing to be there in order to root out the military apparatus of Hamas. All right, did everyone get all those main details, right? Ceasefire, meaning no more actual violence, release of the hostages. Uh, re sorry, I also forgot to mention the release of uh, additional prisoners by Israel, uh, a phased transition with Hamas leaving the Gaza Strip and a different Palestinian government taking over that would be non-militarized, and the withdrawal of Israeli forces from the Gaza um, Strip as well. Okay. Questions before we get into any of the details? Because if we don't have the basic details, then it's not going to help us get anywhere. Why would Hamas oppose this? Any ideas? Power. What? Power. Power. Okay, Hamas loses. Right? Hamas loses because Hamas would no longer be in charge of the Gaza Strip. 
And they have worked really hard to be in charge of the Gaza Strip. They've worked hard to try and get a foothold in the West Bank, and they do have some presence there, but nothing like the formal institutions of power that they have in Gaza. And with power, uh, well, comes a lot of perks. Uh, billions of dollars uh, that have been given to them through various organizations and, and other governments around the world. And of course, the ability to uh, have the power of life and death of millions of Gazans in their hands. That's a hard thing to give up on. But what's the alternative? Well, on paper, the alternative is Israel will continue to pursue the war until they are dead. If that's the option, doesn't getting a chance to get out of Dodge sound like a good idea? If you know that you're going to be murdered, uh, well, it's not really murder, it's being killed because you're literally a terrorist, uh, doesn't someone saying, tell you what I'm going to do, here is a get out of jail free card. You neither have to go to jail nor get shot nor get attacked in any other way. You can leave, go off to wherever you want to retire, and you know, fine, that's where you're going to. That sounds like a pretty good deal. So why would Hamas not think about taking this, at least not so far? Not oh, no, no, they'll be welcome. There are always places out there that will welcome terrorists that are aligned with their agenda, at least on paper, as long as they behave themselves locally. So they, they, there are plenty of countries that will take them. They won't be able to exterminate the Jews. But right now, if the war continues in this current way, they won't be able to do that either, right? Certainly many of them want to martyr themselves if they can't win, uh, and leaving kind of takes away that option. But I, I'm a bit of a realist, and I believe that uh, although there are many rank and file who have uh, really taken on the idea of martyrdom as a goal in life, the vast majority of the leaders, at least, don't really have that as a goal, um, as evinced by the fact that they do not usually lead the martyr attacks that could gain them that advantage. Uh, so again, I'm, I'm a realist at heart, uh, although I play an optimist uh, very often. Uh, I, I don't think that the average um, uh, Hamas leader in Gaza is thinking, well, if this doesn't work out, at least I've got heaven. Uh, I think they, they want to stay alive as long as possible. Right, the ideology is more powerful because they have power. Um, the, they, they are not going to get a lot of people to subscribe to their newsletter if they are just sitting somewhere in Qatar uh, and making wonderful social media posts about how they should overtake uh, Israel. They get a lot more traction by actually being able to do things, by being in a place with power, with the apparatus, and with the ability to force the people in that uh, area to do what they want. That gives them a lot of credibility to drive their agenda. Leaving kind of takes away all of that. But again, and perhaps I'm not making myself clear, or perhaps we're just not thinking about this um, cynically enough, those are all great reasons if you don't have Israeli tanks and bombers coming for you. I mean, yeah, th th that's great. If, 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 if I was Hamas and Israel, Israel was not attacking me, you're absolutely right. There was no reason I would want to leave Gaza. But Israel is coming. Yeah. Oh, I got a hand on the back first, sorry. Great. They don't want another humiliation. Absolutely. Again, death is better than humiliation. All right, I'm going to cut to the, I'm going to cut to the chase here because we're, we're fishing around on it and, and we're not quite hitting it and we do have time, at least the amount I can stand on my feet. Um, they don't think Israel is going to follow through. 
right? Israel, in their mind, again, in their mind, Israel is not going to root them out. Yes, Israel is attacking now. And yes, Israel has blown up a lot of their infrastructure. But come on, Israel is actually going to go door to door and like check everybody's, you know, Hamas, you know, decoder ring to find out whether or not they're a member of Hamas. And, and then they're actually going to get rid of them. Israel doesn't have the stomach for that. Israel has threatened before. Israel has attacked before. Israel has even invaded before during the last 15, 20 years. And Israel has never gotten rid of them before. So why do you think Israel will get rid of them this time? I mean, after all, isn't Hamas kind of right in that assessment? Israel has allowed, uh, Israel has allowed Hamas to continue to fester on its southern border, to fire rockets against civilians, to have cross-border raids, nothing like the scale of the most recent one, of course, but in smaller measure. They have taken hostages before. Israel has gone in, they have done damage, and then Israel has left. And the victory conditions for Hamas are not what you may think are the typical victory conditions for most militaries. If you are Hamas, how do you measure your victory? You're still there. That's it. If you still are alive at the end of Israel's attack, you won. It doesn't matter that you were beaten into the ground. It doesn't matter that they've degraded your military capability. It doesn't matter that it's going to take you another 15 years to build up the infrastructure, let alone your military again. You have still won simply by being there when Israel withdraws. This is what people learned with the Israeli withdrawal from Hezbollah, uh, from the southern section of Lebanon. And this is what has been learned time and time again when other foreign powers have attacked different parts of the Middle East and eventually leave. Right? How did the Taliban win in Afghanistan? Russia left. Russia left. How did they win against the US? The US left. That counts as victory. If you're still there when they leave, you have won. And that's all Hamas needs. They did something terrible to Israel. Israel got really angry and attacked them. They left. We're still here. We've won. And that is what Hamas is betting on. It is betting on the idea that Israel is eventually going to go home, that Israel is going to not want to continue to pursue the fight to the finish, because Israel has never pursued the fight to the finish in any of its previous wars. Let that sink in, despite all of the propaganda out there about genocide and colonial oppressor, blah, 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 like we talked about last week. Israel has never pursued any war until its logical, strategic conclusion. Israel never bombed Cairo into submission. Israel never bombed Damascus into submission. Israel never conquered the entirety of Lebanon. Israel never conquered entire, the entirety of the West Bank or Gaza to the expulsion of any of the citizens there that it felt might be dangerous or harmful. Israel has never done what most other nations do under similar circumstances, because what is our final prayer? And Israel does actually believe that. It also needs to defend herself, but it does believe that not killing more people, if you can avoid it, is a good idea. Uh, something that I know is still hard for the world to stomach, but that is still Israel's point of view. So Hamas is banking on that that Israel is eventually going to stop before it does what it needs to do in order to actually secure that kind of strategic victory against Hamas. And also, come on, Israel, you're going to beat us up? Who do you think is going to fill the vacuum? Right? You, you beat up the PLO, and we stepped in to form the, the new terrorist organization that would take their place. You beat us up, Islamic Jihad will take over, or any of the other splinter groups will rise to power. You can't beat us all, because you won't. You're not going to do what, it need, what needs to be done in order to beat us all. So therefore, yes, we're going to take all the blows, the, the rope-a-dope strategy, and it's going to hurt, and many of us will die, and many more of our civilians will die. But in the end, we'll still be standing, bloodied and bruised, but we'll be laughing while you're home crying. So why in the world would we agree to any plan that said we have to leave when we don't think you have the stomach to make us leave? Makes sense, right? Why in the world would they agree to a ceasefire that gives up more than they think Israel would ever actually be able to win on the battlefield? It's rational. It's not crazy culture. It's not because they're bloodthirsty. It's not because they dream of martyrdom. It's because they've read the history books over the last 15 years. They've lived through that history. And they have 
a reasonable understanding of what the pattern has been over the last 15, 20, well, really longer than that, but just the 15, 20 years that they've been in power. So is Egypt wasting its time? Or are things different this time? Because that's the thing. Learning from history works until the situations change. And when the situations change, they can change rapidly, suddenly, drastically, and dramatically. And I would like to argue that I think the situation did change on October 7th, and Hamas has not quite caught up to it. And that's where we currently are. So do you think Israel is going to pursue this conflict the same way that it pursued the previous conflicts with Hamas? No. Okay, we all have that intuitive understanding. Why not? Thank you. Israel has been roused, if you will. The, in the same way, as, as was mentioned, after the, uh, the Munich uh, massacre during the Olympics, or after uh, the way that Israeli agents pursued uh, Nazi war criminals uh, around the world, there seem to be, throughout Israel's history, certain points, catalysts, where she doesn't stop, where she actually follows through to the full conclusion of a particular campaign, a particular goal. And there is a growing sense within Israel and within those that follow her, her history that October 7th seems to have become one of those moments when Israel is not going to do enough damage to make a statement and then leave, but will pursue until their goals have been achieved. And the goals, remember, are the removal of all the hostages so that they can be brought home, and the removal of Hamas so that they will no longer be able to, to do these sorts of things again. And that second one has been the one that Hamas is betting Israel won't follow through on, and yet it's beginning to look like Israel really means it this time. I, I saw a hand in the back, yes. Like in the book of Esther, as, uh, just for, for the benefit of those who couldn't hear, like in the book of Esther, when it, as Esther pointedly explains to the king, if they just wanted to make us slaves, we wouldn't trouble you, but they want to annihilate us. And when they want to annihilate us, then that's a line that we obviously are not going to put up with. Give us permission to fight back. And they were given permission, and they fought back uh, incredibly viciously uh, in order to destroy the capacity of Haman's allies. They, they were not a particular group, they were Haman's allies that were plotting to destroy them. And Israel seems to be in that same position again right now. Now that's not just because it's been roused, because of its passion, because of its culture, it's also because of real politics, of, of real strategic analysis. If Israel does not pursue this conflict to its full conclusion, it knows that it will be inviting additional attacks of the same kind, by Hamas or by other actors. Hezbollah is waiting in the north to see what comes of all of this. They're keeping their hand in, you know, toying with the idea of doing similar types of invasion when it's their turn, but they're waiting to see what happens in Gaza because they do not want to get into a war where they are utterly destroyed. And if Israel shows that they are willing to carry out an utter destruction of Hamas, then Hezbollah is absolutely going to back off. They, they don't want to get destroyed. Right? They, they, don't, they don't want to be martyred despite the rhetoric. They don't want to go down fighting against the Zionist threat. They want to keep living. And 
they will see what happens in Gaza as an indicator one way or the other of whether or not they should continue their attacks. And so will the Houthis, so will the, the groups in, in Syria, so will any of the other people standing in the wings ready to try and make their name by fighting against the Jews. And Israel has to calculate that because, yes, it's one thing to not go after an enemy that killed a few people, that took a few people. But when you have a full incursion into your country that kills more than a thousand people in, in, in brutal and, and graphic way, then you either go after the people who did that and stop them from ever doing it again, or you open the door for more people to do it. And Israel understands this, and so does her population, and so do her current political leaders, who, mind you, were willing to allow Hamas to continue to occupy Gaza for so long, partly because it did serve Israel's strategic interests by having Gaza and the Palestinian Authority in West Bank be uh, under different authorities, it made it much easier for Israel to deal with the Palestinian question, or not deal with the Palestinian question. And so Israel was not keen to necessarily throw out Hamas immediately, as long as it served that useful and utilitarian function. I'll pick one word at a time. But now, Israel does not have that luxury. Israel, the, po the populace, as well as its politicians, recognize that no political uh, government is going to continue to exist in Israel that allows Hamas to continue to exist in Gaza. It is a us or them as far as the political um, leaders go in both countries. No one can be prime minister of Israel who says, well, let's just let Hamas stay, it's easier. <laughs> That's the end of your career and you will be replaced by someone who has the agenda to continue to pursue it. $64,000 question. Okay, so we've understood why Hamas doesn't want to do this. And we understand why Israel feels they have to destroy Hamas, which should change Hamas's point of view. But Hamas is still banking that even if Israel really, really, really wants to destroy it, that the rest of the world is going to say no. And the rest of the world is made up of lots of different actors with lots of different motivations for that. But some of the most important ones are like, well, Egypt. The fact that Egypt has even proposed this is a huge warning sign to Hamas. And understand that, that Egypt proposing this is not a, we're going to give Hamas a lifeline. This is, we're telling Hamas that you're not getting any support from us, buddy. We'll give you a way out, but we're not going to give you a way to win. Because you have burnt the bridge here. You have burnt the ground, and, and we're not going to let you walk away from this still in charge because we don't trust you because you will do things like this again, and it is going to embroil all of us in more trouble. Do you think Egypt is happy about the, the trade routes that come up through the Suez, that go out into the, the Red Sea and into the Indian Ocean being disrupted over all of this? That, that's Egypt's bread and butter. You know, they, they, they do not, they're not happy with this situation, nor are many of the other Arab governments either. Whatever they may say publicly about the Zionist entity, they're not happy with the way this is currently unfolding and the way it is changing the situation on the ground. And thus, yes, I think that there has been a big shift. But there is one other party that we have to talk about, which is the Palestinian Authority, the government that is currently in charge of the West Bank areas. Now, up until this point, they have made very loud, very clear public statements that they have no intention of ruling Gaza. Right, that this is Israel's fault, that you know, it's the, the, the just rebellion against occupation, yada, 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 and that they are not going to participate in anything that allows Israel to, quote, win. Now, they have to make those statements. Because if they say, oh, great, yes, Israel, please put us in power in, in Gaza, well, now they're, t now they're the toadies of Israel, and they've lost all legitimacy everywhere for everyone and they'll be dead before morning, right? um, or maybe, maybe by mid-afternoon. Right? They, they, they know that they cannot be seen as collaborators with Israel. 
They can cooperate when they believe it's truly in the interest of their population or that they can get away with it, but collaboration is a whole different you know, ball of wax. But by having this be a, an idea that is being put forward by an Arab country, Egypt, one of the most powerful in the region, having this be put forward as an international pressure and being dragged into it, in quotes, kicking and screaming of, no, don't make me be in charge of Gaza again, if they can be put in a position where they seem like they are being coerced to do so, they might just go along with it. Now recognize, as much as they want to be in charge of Gaza, again, that also opens up a whole new can of worms. Because as important as it was for most of the Israeli politicians of the last 20 years that Gaza and the West Bank be ruled by separate and very rival uh, factions, it has been important for the Palestinian Authority leadership that they not be in charge of Gaza too. It's actually been very profitable for them. Because if they are in charge of Gaza, as well as the West Bank, well then, now we get back to negotiations. Now we actually have a unified Palestinian authority, a unified Palestinian government, in some theory representing the Palestinian people as a whole. And we have Israel representing the Israelis as a whole. So now we can come back to the table, and now we can start talking about all the really, really hard things that caused the problems back in the Second Intifada and the end of the, er, the first Oslo Accords. And the Palestinian Authority is not exactly interested in reopening those negotiations, because they know that any of those negotiations to move forward are going to require actual concessions by the Palestinians just as much as concessions by the Israelis. And that's not a great place to be if you're a Palestinian leader, just like it's not a fun place to be if you're an Israeli leader. No one wants to come back saying, guess what I gave up to our opposition. But they might. If they recognize that the way the winds are changing, the way the attitude of the people within the, the Gulf Coast states, and, and you know, Bahrain, United Arab Emirates, uh, and as well as uh, Saudi Arabia is shifting, as well as attitudes within Europe of not being willing to put up with more of this because of problems at home, as well as the major energy crisis that's already happening thanks to the Ukraine war, which is a whole other layer to all of this, they might just recognize that now may be the only time they may get a deal that's at all favorable. Maybe they do need to be in that position again. And if Hamas can recognize that all of their friends are no longer answering their calls, that no one is willing to work with them anymore, no one's willing to back them, then that victory condition of, hey, we're still here, bloodied and hurt, but we're still here, so we won, that begins to go away as an option. Because if the rest of the world is really willing to make lots of noise, but do nothing to actually stop Israel from pursuing this war to its logical conclusion, then Hamas is going to be destroyed. And if Hamas believes that, then Hamas will look for an alternative. But we're speculating, because people can make mistakes in these calculations. Hamas could err on the side of history and say Israel has never pursued anything like this before. You know, Eichmann, whatever, you know, that's one person, they're not going to invade. They don't want Gaza again. They gave Gaza up for nothing because there was too much trouble for them. Why in the world would they want to do this again? And there are too many of us, it's too hard, they're not going to be willing to pay the price in, in soldiers and, and, and money, their economy will tank. They may make that calculation. Now, personally, I think that's a mistake, because I think that Israel is committed to this time till the end. But Hamas could make that error. Or Hamas could think that Egypt won't really, won't really let, leave them out to dry. Saudi Arabia and the others aren't, aren't really going to just let them hang for all of this. And again, they may be making a miscalculation there because as much rhetoric as has come out of the other Middle Eastern countries has been anti-Israel, it has been of a different, reduced degree of anti-Israel compared to previous situations. That is to say, if you go back just 10, 15 years ago and you look at the rhetoric over Israel uh, retaliations against rocket fire from Gaza, it was much hotter and angrier from many of these other countries than their rhetoric about Israel's actual full ground invasion of Gaza. Because they recognize that their strategic interests really no longer align with supporting groups like Hamas. They're too busy dealing with groups like Hamas within their own country or on their own border 
and being supported by their main regional rival, Iran. So Hamas may miscalculate, and I fear that they might, because they, I think, miscalculated in this whole endeavor from day one. But they may actually be persuaded by their former friends and allies to take what Egypt's offering, that it might be the best deal they're going to get, that it might be their only chance to actually get out of there alive. I don't know. I'm not a Navi. But what I do know is that if they continue to miscalculate, then there will continue to be unnecessary deaths. The deaths of Israeli soldiers, the deaths of, Ga the deaths of Gazan civilians who are also fed up being held hostage by this terrorist organization. We can only get to that moment of peace, of shalom, when people recognize that there are other ways to live than fighting and killing for things that don't need to be fought for or killed over. That's why we end every Amidah with that blessing of peace. Because everything else could be fine, but without peace, it's not. May the people of Gaza recognize that on their own. May their leaders recognize that their options are few and dwindling. And may Israel and all of her neighbors know true peace so that all of the people that have been horribly put through suffering may know what it is to live in a world as God truly wishes. Shabbat Shalom.